Okay, um, thank you, Mandy. So I've been asked to um, give you an update on research over the last 10 years, so what's new in osteoporosis research. And what I plan to do is, first of all, identify what the big issues are in terms of the diagnosis and management of osteoporosis, and then talk to you a bit about how research that's been done over the last few years has really targeted those issues and has, has improved things for us. So I'm going to start from first principles with the question of why do bones break? And in essence, there are two issues. The first, you can see on the left, is the strength of the bone. And the second, on the right, is about the trauma that's applied to that bone. So in terms of how strong a bone is, or how it lacks strength, this is dependent on its mass, which is dependent on the size of the bone and its bone density and also the microstructure within the bone. The trauma applied to bones usually occurs as a result of a fall, so therefore it's important to know what risk of fall an individual has, and also potentially what type of fall they have. So younger people tend to fall sometimes forwards, put out their arm, and then potentially are at risk of a wrist fracture. In later life, falls change a little bit, and some people will fall sideways or backwards and not be able to get their hand out, and therefore they may be more at risk of hip fractures. So the type of fall also makes a difference. So bearing in mind that the two main factors are bone strength and the forces applied to it, if we then look at how we stop bone breaking, the two main things that we can do are, firstly, to put in interventions to reduce falls, and secondly, do things to try and improve bone strength. And you may have heard from one of the stalls next door that there are different falls interventions. So these can include um, looking at people's vision, because obviously if they have impaired sight, that, that can increase risk. Looking for weakness, looking for problems with balance. And also sometimes people will have an occupational therapist that will go into their home and look at the environment and to check that there aren't too many obstacles there that people could potentially trip over. So all of these things can be done. In terms of strengthening the bone, Dr. Sam has obviously discussed quite a few things that you can do in terms of lifestyle issues that can improve things. But in general, one of the most effective things that we've got are the medication. And for drugs like bisphosphonates, like alendronate or residronate, there's an approximate halving in fracture risk for every, for every drug that you take. Um, however, all drugs potentially have side effects. And so what we need to do is weigh up the risks of having the drug with the benefits that we're thinking we're likely to get in terms of reduced fracture risk. So moving on from that, really the question is how do we improve the risk-benefit ratio in terms of the types of treatments that we're using? And this is one of the big issues that we've had in the last 10 years. So there are three ways that we can do this. <clears throat> Firstly, we need to identify people who are at high risk of fracture. If somebody's risk of breaking a bone in the next 10 years is 50% and we halve that to 25%, that's a 25% absolute reduction in fracture risk. Whereas if their risk initially is only 4% of having a fracture in the next 10 years and we halve that, we're only halving it to 2%, so that's a 2% absolute risk. So it's really important when we're trying to get the best out of our treatments that we identify people who are at high risk of fracture, so we're making sure we treat those. It's also obviously important that if we can identify treatments that work even better, that we're going to have greater benefits with our treatments. So at the moment, as I said, bisphosphonates approximately halve the risk of fracture, but if we've got drugs that we can bring in and research that reduce the risk of fracture by 60% or 70%, then again, um, that's going to be more beneficial in terms of risk benefit. And lastly, what we've started to do is to look at whether we can identify whether people with certain diseases will have specific abnormalities in their bone, and if so, whether we could then target our treatments to that specific area. So that's another area that we've been looking at recently. So if I look at identifying people at high risk of fracture first, as Dr. Summer has mentioned before, there are specific risk factors for fracture. And we're very fortunate that in 2008, in conjunction with the World Health Organization, um, 
something called FRAX was developed. And this is a fracture risk assessment tool. And what it does is it uses the epidemiological research that's been carried out, so in terms of risk factors, in terms of patterns of fracture, to allow us to calculate using fairly simple risk factors that most people will have um, to work out what the 10-year risk of a major osteoporotic fracture is and a hip fracture is. So here is where it has the risks given at the bottom. So this is the risk of major osteoporotic fracture in the next 10 years and hip fracture in the next 10 years. And this is available online, so it's available to the public and also to GPs. And what you do is put in your age, gender, weight, height, whether you've had a previous fracture, and that's a low trauma fracture, so one that um, looks like it's suggesting bone fragility. Whether either of your parents had a hip fracture, whether you currently smoke, um, whether you take glucocorticoids, so drugs like prednisolone, whether you have rheumatoid arthritis, there are certain conditions that predispose to osteoporosis, so that includes celiac disease and type 1 diabetes, and whether you drink more than three units of alcohol per day. So these are all things that people will know about themselves and the GP will know about you, and you can use that information without a DEXA scan, bone density, to um, calculate this score. We then plot that score against thresholds for treatment which, are, which have been suggested by the National Osteoporosis Guidelines Group, or NOG. So people who fall, so this is the risk, sorry, for 10 years of major osteoporotic fracture on the y-axis, and then down here is the individual's age. You can see this person falls in the red zone, and so in this person we would consider a treatment such as a bisphosphonate. If they fall in the green zone, their risk of fracture is low, and therefore usually we would just suggest um, lifestyle advice and the sort of things that have been discussed previously in terms of trying to avoid smoking and drink ad and alcohol at moderate levels. If they fall into the yellow zone, the risk is intermediate, so in order to identify whether somebody really is high or low risk, we would potentially do a DEXA scan, so scan their bones to see whether they have osteoporosis or osteopenia and how that affects their risk. So having said that, what do we think is the biggest single risk factor from the FRAX calculator in terms of having a future fracture? Anyone like to suggest? Age is a big one, I think. So certainly there's a sort of, as you get older, then there is an increased risk of fracture. But there's something else that can happen independent of age. So lifestyle issues, which will have some, but something that can happen to you that then increases the risk of you having a further fracture. Sorry? Yeah, so fracture itself. So if you've had a single fracture, that significantly increases the risk that you'll have a future fracture. So this is a uh, picture of a wrist fracture. Um, as a result, it's very important that we pick up people who've had a fracture and they get properly assessed and managed. Um, so that they don't have further fractures. So this basically shows that about 16% of the population will have had either a prior fracture or a recent fracture. But this small proportion of the population, just 16%, makes up half of future hip fractures, whereas the other half of hip fractures come from the other 84% of the population. So having had one fracture is a risk factor. And treating people that have had a single fracture or more than one fracture is called secondary prevention and, prevent, and treating somebody who's never had a fracture is primary prevention. Now it seems fairly straightforward that having a fracture is a big risk factor and that we should be assessing all these patients but globally the health service is very poor at doing this. In this country there are areas that it's very good and obviously Portsmouth has a very good service but there are areas where we're not very good at doing this. As a result, the National Osteoporosis Society has come up with the campaign of Stop at One, which I think you'll hear more about this morning, which is raising awareness about the importance of secondary fracture prevention, targeting people who've had a fracture to stop them having more. Also, there's been a lot of research looking at the best way of making sure that as a health profession, we identify people who've fractured and appropriately treat them if needed. And the best way that's been shown to do that is with a fracture liaison service. So I'm not sure if you've heard of fracture liaison service or how much you know about them, 
but basically these are services within a hospital with the main aim of identifying all patients that fracture and then assessing their risk and if they are high risk for a further fracture, which the majority will be, as ensuring that they're on treatment to try and stop it happening again. And this is a very big um, area of research and, and work at the moment. And I personally am involved in something called Capture the Fracture, which is a campaign from the International Osteoporosis Foundation where we provide um, assistance to try to improve the number and the quality of fracture liaison services worldwide. And this map just shows the number of fracture liaison services worldwide that have provided us with data so that we've been able to assess their fracture liaison service and we grade them from gold, silver to bronze. Um, and obviously the ones in green are those that haven't been assessed yet. But clearly there are massive gaps here and there are a lot of places worldwide that need to have fracture liaison services, lots of hospitals that require these that don't have them yet. So this is an area of ongoing work. Before I finish talking about fracture risk, I just wanted to show you this work from Professor Harvey in Southampton, which basically shows what proportion of people are having fractures when you compare it to the time after their first fracture. And as you can see, directly after the first fracture, you're at much higher risk of having a second fracture. So we need to know that we need to be targeting people that have had a fracture, but that we need to be doing it quickly because the increased risk particularly is at this point, but the increased risk is maintained out to at least 10 years. So once you've had a fracture, that increased risk is there persistently. So now looking at um, whether we can develop treatments that are more effective. So in order to do this, I'm going to tell you first a bit about how bones work, um, in terms of how the cells work and the physiology, then explain the treatments we've got at the moment and how they work, and then lastly tell you about the new drugs that are being researched at the moment and hopefully will be available in the next few years. So the most important cells within bone, because it is a living tissue, um, are the osteoblast, which is here, which makes bone, the osteoclast, which breaks down bone, and the osteocytes, which are signaling cells, which tell the osteoblast and the osteoclast what to do. Now, the most common treatment that a lot of people have used are bisphosphonates, like alendronate, or zoledronate, or pomidronate. And a lot of, these are usually our first line sort of drugs, things like alendronate and residronate. And what they do is they work by blocking the osteoclast, which breaks down the bone, which can then help to overall increase the amount of bone, or at least maintain the amount of bone that people have. Denosumab works in a similar way, so prolia or denosumab acts by blocking one of the molecules that would normally stimulate the osteoclast and so again it stops bone from being broken down. Teriparatide is a drug which is like a hormone, parathyroid hormone and basically this we give by injection under the skin once a day for 18 months and this has effects stimulating both osteoblasts and osteoclasts but it stimulates the osteoblast to form bone more than the osteoclasts so overall, it sort to increase the amount of bone you have. Another drug is strontium. Um, this is given in a sachet form, so it's, it's something that you can drink, and usually given in the evening. Um, it's not known exactly how this works, but it may have effects on osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Now, we tend to use this drug less now because more recently it's been shown to be associated with things such as clots in the leg and the lung and also with heart attacks. So we only use it usually now as a, not as a last resort, but after other medication have been tried and in people who are at very low risk of any of those conditions. So now moving on to the drugs which are being researched at the moment. There's a new drug called adanacatib, which blocks one of the enzymes inside your osteoclast to stop them functioning. Um, and so this again will block the effects of the osteoclasts and then stop bones from being broken down. Now this has been shown to increase bone density in studies and the fracture studies are being carried out at the moment. So hopefully it will be proven to reduce fractures and then be available for us to use in the next few years. In order to understand how the last new drug that's being um, investigated at the moment works, we need to understand that normally the osteocytes produce something called sclerostin, 
which then blocks the osteoblast. So it's usually inhibiting these cells and stopping them from making bone. So the pharmaceutical companies have invented something called Romasuzumab, which is a drug which then blocks sclerostin, which then stops the sclerostin from blocking the osteoblast, so the osteoblast can work again. Okay, it's a little bit complicated, but that's how it works. Therefore, it allows the osteoblast to continue to produce bone. And therefore, that will increase bone, level, bone density levels, and that can reduce fracture. And in fact, there has been a study that was presented uh, in the World Congress on Osteoporosis recently, which has shown that if you're treating somebody with romosuzumab and this other group with teriparatide, it appears that those on romosuzumab may have better increases in their bone density than those on teriparatide. So potentially it may be more effective, but this is, needs to be borne out in fracture studies rather than just looking at bone density. Okay, so lastly, I wanted to look more at whether we can identify specific issues in the bone that are related to a certain disease, and therefore in the future whether we'll be able to target therapies more rather than giving everybody with osteoporosis very similar treatments. So usually, I'm sure you'll be aware that we assess bone density, so your bone health, with a DEXA scan. And conventionally, we scan the hip, and we also scan the lower part of the spine. And what this gives us is a single score at each point, which is a measure of bone density. Okay, and that gives you a measure, an assessment of bone strength. However, uh, and, and this is a very useful thing to have because for every one point lower in your bone density there's approximately a doubling of risk of fracture so it is an important measure however bone is not uniform all the way through so one number can't give you all the information about the health of your bone because in fact bones look very much in cross section like a crunchy bar okay around the outside you have a solid fairly solid rim of bone um, which is called the cortex. In the middle, you have a meshwork, a honeycomb meshwork, that looks like this, called the trabecular bone. So a single value of density of bone is useful, but it's not perfect. And actually, we've got a lot of new scanning techniques that we're using in research that allow us to obtain this information. So again, you can see the cortex around the outside, and this is the meshwork of trabecular bone in the middle. And this, these are 3D images, obviously looking at the same sort of thing. And using this, we are able to identify the difference between people with and without osteoporosis. So on the left here, you can see that, people, that the trabeculae, so in this region, these rods um, are, and plates are thicker and more in number, whereas on the right in the osteoporotic bone, they're a lot thinner and fewer in number. So we can see the differences. Now we're able to do this, and I've been lucky enough to do research using what we call the Extreme CT Scanner, which is worth about a quarter of a million pounds for one scanner. Um, and we can use this to scan the, the forearm and also the lower leg of individuals in research. Now it's not known exactly what it means for clinical practice, so it's not used in clinical practice at the moment, but it does give us a lot of useful information to, to sort of start to investigate other diseases. What it does, it gives us this sort of image. So this is of the tibia, so the shin bone. And it gives you the cortex around the outside and the trabecular bone in the middle. And it can, it can actually give you information about the number of trabeculae, how thick they are, how thick the cortex is, how dense the cortex is. So there's a huge amount of data that comes out. And what we've done is use this to look at people with different diseases. Now, this is just one example, but it can be used for other things as well. We know that when you compare people with type 2 diabetes, which is the one that tends to come on later in life, those with type 2 diabetes tend to have higher rates of fracture than people who don't have type 2 diabetes. However, if you measure their bone density using a DEXA scan, you get pretty much the same results overall. So they don't seem to have lower bone density. So the question was raised as to why this was. So we scanned people with type 2 diabetes and those without it, and actually what we found 
is that if you look, this is somebody without type 2 diabetes, and they have a fairly solid cortex, but actually if you look at the cortex of somebody with type 2 diabetes, on average they tend to have more holes within the cortex. So this is more cortical porosity. So, yeah, so the cortex is more porous. And we think that although this may not have a big effect on bone density from a DEXA scan, it may be what's putting people at slightly higher risk of fracture. So this is just one example of how we're starting to move to look at individual diseases, such as type 2 diabetes. We've looked at it in celiac disease, and it looks like it's the trabecular area that tends to get affected by celiac disease. And interestingly, after you go onto a gluten-free diet, the trabecular region increases in bone density. So it actually seems to recover after you go onto a, uh, a gluten-free diet. But there are various ways that this has been used, and potentially will in the future. And it's possible that this will therefore allow us, in the future, to have more targeted treatments to specific areas of bone. But I think this is many years away, and it's at very early stages at the moment. So I just wanted to um, summarize. It's very important that we identify people at high risk of fracture because they're going to get the best benefit from treatment. So we can do this using the FRAX tool that's available online. Uh, it can be used by GPs and is, it's been used, I think, over 4 million times so far um, to assess fracture risk. But also it's important that we know that people who've had a fracture are at high risk and they all need to be assessed. We have several drugs available at the moment, but there are newer drugs in the pipeline. Adanacatib and Romasuzumab are two of those. There are others coming as well. Um, and we are able to use, in research, high-resolution imaging techniques to give us more information about bones so we can understand more about what's happening related to different diseases, which may, in the, sort of many years from now, I think, potentially allow us to target our treatments more um, to exactly what the problem is. But I think for now we do have good, effective treatments anyway. Thank you.